want to extend a very warm welcome to everybody this evening on behalf of Stormy Fleet Church and trust that we will all know God's blessing as we gather together around the word. And we're going to begin by singing from Psalm uh, number 11. And this is from Sing Psalms. And we're going to sing from verse 4 to verse 7. The Lord is in his holy place. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. His eyes observe the human race, and in his sight each one is known. The Lord examines all the just, the righteous ones he proves and tests. But all those who love wickedness and violence his soul detests. Upon the wicked he will rain as fiery coals and sulfur hot. A scorching wind will beat on them, such punishment will be their lot. For God the Lord is righteous still, in righteousness he takes delight. They alone will see his face, who are in heart and life upright. Psalm 41, Psalm, sorry, Psalm 11, from verse 4 to verse 7. The Lord is in his holy place. The Lord is in his holy place. The that you are in your holy place and that you look down upon this earth but not only that you look down upon the earth but that you're involved in this earth that you have made uh, we read about what your word tells us Emmanuel God with us and this is really quite remarkable when we realize the holiness of God that cannot bear or tolerate or even countenance or look upon sin and yet we find that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been made a sin-bearer. And uh, we marvel at this great truth, and uh, we are amazed at the wonder and the graciousness of God. We give thanks for your plans and your purposes, and we give thanks for your wisdom, which is beyond anything that we could ever think or devise. The way of salvation is really something that is altogether awesome and wonderful. We give thanks for the faith, Lord, that lays hold upon who you are and what you have done. Sometimes we feel that faith is strong. Sometimes we feel that our Christian hold upon you is vibrant and powerful. And other times we feel weak and feeble and frail. 
Sometimes Satan comes with all his temptations to cast doubts upon the whole way of salvation, upon who you are. Uh, just as he said at the very beginning to Adam and to Eve, hath God said, did God say? And sometimes he whispers this into our ears as well. And we have to confess, Lord, that there are times that fears and doubts and worries uh, begin to invade our thoughts. And so we pray, <coughs> pray, Lord, for deliverance from all these things that come come in and, and upon us. We have to confess, Lord, that we're feeble, that we're weak. We are so prone to sin. We're so prone to waywardness. We're so prone to losing the right way. Our footsteps do not hold to your path in the way that they should. But we give thanks, Lord, for that there is a desire to follow you. And when, when there is a desire to follow the Lord and to walk in his ways, we know that that desire has been created by yourself. That desire has been implanted in our hearts and is an evidence of the fact that there is a new life because the old life does not want to follow the Lord. The old life wants to follow self and uh, to be in control of life and to be master of one's own destiny. And so we pray, Lord, for when there is a willing desire that you will rule and reign within our heart. And we pray that that might be true for every single one of us, uh, that you will be King and Lord in our heart and in our life. We pray that you will bless us this evening as we come under your word. And help us, Lord, to realise that your word is there for us, that we might derive benefit from it, that we might learn from it. And as we come to historical parts of your truth, and we realize that, as has been said, history is his story, and that it has pleased you to record certain things in order that we may learn from it. And we pray that we will learn from it. It was, Lord, never to be dismissive of your word. It was, Lord, never to think of ourselves as above your word, that we don't need to hear it again, that we know it already. That is a sure way of heading to a fall. Help us then, Lord, to be attentive to your truth and to be careful in our way and in our walk. We ask that you will be with all our loved ones, our homes, our families, and all whom we love. And although there are so many restrictions uh, that uh, confine us so that we are not able to do or to meet in the way that we used to, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will be with all whom we love and that you will guard and keep every home and every family uh, near and far. We give thanks that near and far doesn't uh, matter with you because you are in the same place all the time with everybody. And so we pray that your blessing will be upon each and every one. We pray to bless us as a congregation. We pray that you will bless us uh, in our homes and families. We pray with those who are sick and laid aside. We pray for the elderly and those who are struggling. Those, Lord, who are struggling uh, maybe with the years having gone, uh, the advanced years where there is weakness of body and frailty of mind. We pray for those, Lord, who are maybe in a stage of life where they're beginning to lose their understanding and maybe suffering through uh, different forms of dementia or Alzheimer's. Very difficult for those who suffer from that and also those who are seeking to help them and to care for them. And so we pray that in all these different situations and circumstances that your grace will be known and that your love will be shown. We pray, Lord, for all who mourn and those who are heavy in heart, those, Lord, who have experienced pain and sorrow in life. We pray, Lord, that you will heal the brokenhearted and that you will lift up the put down this downcast spirit and that you will dry the tears from off the eyes, and that you will heal the heart that is broken. O Lord, O God, we pray that you will do in and for us far and beyond what we could ask or think. And we pray for our leaders and all in authority over us. We pray for that those who have the rule over us may realize that you ultimately have the rule over them, and that one day they are answerable to you for how they have lived and administered and worked uh, for you in this world. Lord, what a responsibility is placed upon shoulders and help us to realize that we are all answerable.
to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Help us to remember that one day we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ in order that we may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. And help us then, Lord, to shield and shelter in Christ, because he is our only hope and stay, our only refuge in that day. And so we pray that we will not face Jesus Christ as a stranger, but as a friend, that we will face him as the bridegroom and not as somebody who is to hear these fearful words, Depart from me, for I never knew you. O oh Lord, our God, we pray that everybody who is listening into this service tonight will in time know the voice of the living God and will hear the voice of the living God in a way that their souls will live. And so we pray that you will bless us nationally and in the face of this pandemic and that it gradually, bit by bit, that the corner will be turned and that we will see the effect of the vaccine uh, with diminishing numbers of those t testing positive and those becoming ill from it and those being hospitalized and uh, we remember all those who are who have uh, all the families that have experienced death as a result of it we remember all the other illnesses that often have to had to take a back seat and where treatments have been put on hold and where surgery has been put on hold and we pray, Lord, that these things may indeed be brought back into place very soon so that people will receive what they need. We ask now that you will be with us, that you will guard us and keep us and guide us and bless our NHS and all our carers. And, uh, we pray your blessing upon all who are uh, keeping the, as it were, the very arteries of society going. There are so many different areas. Remember all those who, even in our own island, have been affected uh, by this illness, and we commit them to your care and keeping. Bless us, then, we pray. Cleanse us from our sin. In Jesus' name we ask all. Amen. <clears throat> last week, um, just a wee word to the young folk. Last week I was, I went up to the castle grounds with little Joshua, who's now about two or two and a half, or they're about it. And uh, he loves the castle grounds. But they went up, I went round to the front of the castle, and what a wonderful job they have uh, made there. The wall in front of the castle is stunning. And there's little bits that have been tarred, and bits where grass has been lain, and there are uh, other areas, and there's a beautiful at either end, as it were, of the castle, at the front, there's a big circular uh, part, and it's so beautifully set out. And there's this very, very fine gravel on it. So I was there with Joshua, and I uh, took out the phone, on my phone, to take some a few pictures, because you're looking down, I was doing two or three photos of the castle, and just the layout of everything, so beautiful. And then you look down to the, to the harbour, and it's... A great view uh, there of Stornoway. So as I was doing that, I heard this uh, noise from behind me, and there's this. We were standing in this very fine coloured gravel that's been beautifully put in place. There's a couple of workmen just a wee bit over. I think they were just checking something because most of the work there seems to have been done. And he was shuffling through the gravel. And he was obviously enjoying the noise it was making, but what a mess he was making because he was shoveling it this way and that way. And I said to him, no, 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 no. And he was enjoying himself because recently we had been down at the beach when the weather was, was quite good, went down one day, and he was enjoying making uh, marks in the sand with, the, with, the, with his feet and making all kinds of shapes. And he was trying to do the same in the gravel. And he was enjoying the noise it was making, the shivering. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. And I had to go down on my hands and knees and try and smooth it all out. And I was thinking, these workmen would be looking over there and saying, what little hooligan is that? But the thing was, he didn't realize that he was making a terrible mess of something that was so beautiful. So I was trying to smooth it all out. I was saying, no, no, you're not allowed to do that. And it was fine with that. 
So away we went and I, I smoothed it out again. You know, it got me thinking and I thought, you know, God made this world absolutely beautiful. And over everything he said that it was good. And then he made us, man and woman. And he said, very good. But you know what happened? Just like little Joshua there started to make a mess of something that was very beautiful. And he didn't think it was a mess. As far as he was concerned, he was enjoying himself. And you know, the sad thing is we have made an absolute mess of the beauty of what God has made. We're making a mess of the world that God has made. And we've made such a mess of ourselves because of sin. And even although we may sometimes think what we're doing is right, God is looking down and he's saying, what a mess. You are made of everything that I made so beautifully. And that is why God has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to sort out the mess that we are made. Because we can't sort it ourselves. It's only Jesus that can sort it. And what we have to do is to ask the Lord to help us to see the mess that we're making of our own lives, which is called our sin. Because if we don't see that, we won't ask him for help. We won't ask him for forgiveness. We won't ask him to clean our hearts, to clean up the mess. We have to see first that there is a mess. And so your prayer and my prayer must be to the Lord. Lord, help me to see the mess that sin has made in my life. And at the same time, help me, Lord, to see Jesus who has come to deal with the mess and with the sin in my life and to make it all clean again. And that's what Jesus does. And that's what Jesus loves to do. So you ask the Lord to help you to see what you need and to see Jesus who will help you. And you know, if we trust in Jesus, the Lord promised us that at the end of the day, he's going to take us home with himself. And he tells us in his word that there's going to be new heavens and a new earth where everything again is going to be beautiful. And there'll never, ever, ever again be a mess. And we will all live forever in with the peace and in the joy and in the love of Jesus forever and ever. Isn't that wonderful? That's what the gospel is all about. And I hope and pray that you today or tonight will know this Jesus as your very own. We're going to read God's word now, and it's in Second Kings, Second Kings and chapter nineteen. <clears throat> As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priests covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of, of distress, of rebuke and of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servant of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. The Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning um, to Haggad, king of Cush, behold, he has set out to fight against you. 
So he sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the king of Assyria has done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them? The nations that my father destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Resef, and the people of Eden, who were in Telassar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of uh, Sepharim, the king of Hinav, the kings of Ilva? Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you are alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and the earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from the hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is a word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you, she scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel? By your messengers you have mocked the Lord. And you have said, With my many chariots I have gone up to the heights of the mountains, and to the far recesses of Lebanon. I felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses. I entered its furthest lodging place in its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters. I dried up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins, while the inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded, and have become like the plants of the field, and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops, blighted before it is grown. But I know you're sitting down, and you're going out and coming in, and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me, and your complacency has come into my ears, I will put my hook in your nose, and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. And this shall be the sign for you. This year, eat what grows of itself, and in the second year, what springs of the same. Then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downwards, and bear fruit upwards. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion, a, a band of survivors. The seal of the Lord will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He will not come into this city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he shall return. He shall not come into this city, declares the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of Assyria. And when people rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. And as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramelech and uh, Shara, Shara, I said his son struck him down with a sword, 
and he escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esa Hadon, his son, reigned in his place. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading of this chapter of his holy word. Now I want us this evening to consider uh, from verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went out to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. But they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, O God, save us, please, from the hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Question is, how do you react when trouble comes your way? Uh, it's a very important question, something that we have to ask ourselves. Uh, as Christians, we often think that it's the automatic reaction that when trouble comes into people's lives, that they will turn to the Lord. But uh, sadly, we know that that is not the case. That there are many, many people, and trouble has come into their lives, and God is not on the radar. And they have absolutely no intention of turning toward the living and true God. But for others, the day that trouble and difficulties came into their lives, it was the day when they began to turn to the living and true God. And maybe many of you tonight who listen, can you can think back to a period in your own life where something happened or some events happened or where your life was turn round, so to speak, and it was through that that you began, or maybe for the first time, to really inquire or to, to seek after the living and true God. And whether it's trouble or not, I hope tonight that if you haven't already uh, been seeking the living and true God, that you will begin so to do. Now for this king, Hezekiah, we find that trouble has come up upon him big style. Hezekiah was a good king. In fact, uh, the Bible will show us that Hezekiah was the best king that, that Judah had. Remember how Israel split into two, into two, the northern part of Israel, and then there was the southern part of Judah. And uh, the, Hezekiah was termed the best king that Judah actually had. He was a man who, who made tremendous reforms and restored uh, the, the faith, that restored the worship of God as the key worship within the land. He broke down so many of the altars and images to false gods. He was a man who, who was single-minded in his pursuit of God. But as is often the case, or as is always the case, uh, Hezekiah had his weakness, and or maybe his weaknesses. And as you read through the life of Hezekiah, as we find it in in Kings and in Chronicles, it would appear that pride uh, was an area in his life uh, that he was prone to sinning in. And of course, pride is, has often been termed the mother of all sin. And so we have to be, to be very careful. And Satan, of course, who knows us inside out, uh, is the master of getting us in our weak points. He knows what we're, what we're liable to, to fall. He knows what we're about. He's always watching and waiting. He's there just ready to pounce. And he'll get us. He, and you know, he's also very good at getting us when we're down, when we're tired, when we're weak, when we're sick. You know, we're, we're more open to his temptations. We're more open to these things. But he also gets us sometimes when we're overconfident and when we're maybe feeling self-reliant. Again, we're in a very dangerous place. But it's not just in our weak points that he gets us. He can also get us in our strong points. We must always be on the guard against him. So here is this, here is this man, uh, Hezekiah. As we say, he's a, a really good man. 
but as I, as we said, he made his mistakes. And one of the the important things that we learn from the life of Hezekiah is that he learned from his mistakes. And that again is key to our development of growth as Christians, that we learn from our mistakes. No Christian goes through this life without making mistakes. We make them repeatedly. But you know, it's good that we have teachable spirits and that we learn from our mistakes and that we go to the Lord and say, Lord, please help me here. I, I know what I've done. I've seen what I've done here. I know the wrong that I have done. Lord, help me to learn from this. And God will help us to learn uh, from and through these things. Now, there were times that Hezekiah really got it wrong. For instance, there were times when he, when he turned to Egypt for help rather than to the living and true God. There were times when he listened to the advice of godless counselors and advisors rather than listening to the advice of the living and true God. And you know, there are times that we can be like that as well in life. And it might be possible that you today or tonight, that you, as you look at your life and you say, you know, it's not the word of God that I'm taking my advice from. I'm not walking in all my ways according to God's word. I'm listening to the word. I'm listening to people. I'm taking my advice from my own heart. I'm doing what I want. But let me tell you, that is not the way to go. It might go well for a while, but guaranteed it won't go well continually. And there'll come a time when the Lord will say to his people who are going down a road like that, what are you doing here? Just like Elijah, he said, what, what are you doing here, Elijah? Remember when Elijah ran away? What are you doing, Elijah? And God will sometimes come to us when we've taken the wrong path and when we've closed our ears to his word and when we've gone according to our own heart or even the influence of the world or the influence of others. God said, what are you doing? You're going the wrong way. You're doing. The, you're going in the wrong direction, and that's how it was for uh, Hezekiah. And there were periods where he went completely in the wrong direction, and Hezekiah ended up compromising. You know, when you begin to mix it with the world, and you begin to embrace some of the world into your into your thinking and into your way. You know what else is going to inevitably almost happen? Is that you're going to end up compromising. It's going to be very difficult. Now, I'm not saying for one moment that we're not involved with the world and engage with the world and be part of the world. We, can't, we couldn't live otherwise. But we have to stick to our Christian principles. Sometimes that's going to be hard. And often the world will say, oh, come on, you, know, you, get a bit, you need a bit of slack, you a bit of slack here. You need to compromise a wee bit here. You know, the moment you begin to compromise, the world is never satisfied with you to, with a little compromise. It'll keep at you and at you and at you and at you. Once you give, it'll want more and more and more and more. And Hezekiah found that. Because the first time Sennacherib came up against uh, and invaded Jerusalem and Judah, uh, Hezekiah just said to Sennacherib, oh, I've done wrong. Whatever you impose upon me, I will give. And Sennacherib said, okay. And he demanded so much wealth from Hezekiah, so much gold, that Hezekiah took all the gold that he had. Do you know what he started doing in the end? Stripping the gold off the doors of the temple in order to give Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, what he wanted. See, the moment you begin to compromise, the world is never satisfied. It'll want more and more and more, and it'll strip you down and down and down and down. But the good thing with regard to Hezekiah is that he learned from his mistake, because here is another Sennacherib is again invading, and Hezekiah has learned from his mistakes. Because it must, you know this, can you imagine this man of God who restored the worship of God, who was single-minded in his pursuit of restoring the worship of God, stripping the gold off the temple doors to give to this man who hated God, who mocked God, who held the God of heaven and earth in absolute derision. And Hezekiah is having to give him the gold from the temple. 
You know, there's, I'm sure Hezekiah had many a sleepless night. And I could imagine Hezekiah saying to the Lord, Lord, oh, please give me another chance. If something like that ever happens again, Jesus, I guarantee you, Lord, I won't compromise. Maybe you've been down that road, maybe not as extreme as with Hezekiah. But you've been down that road and you know the hurt that it, that it has caused you. You know it's hurt the Lord. It hurts the Lord's people who might be involved. It hurts you as well. Well, Hezekiah learned because uh, the king, Sennacherib, is back again with the, this mighty Assyrian army. An, an army that struck terror in all the nations of the world. The, for this period, the Assyria was the dominant nation, the dominant force in the world. And they were a cruel, they were, they were a ferocious nation. And history shows us that they, they were incredibly cruel. Uh, they, what part of their normal practice was to blind their, uh, their captives and to hack limbs off and to cut tongues out. And to, even to skin people alive. History shows us they were unbelievably cruel. And so they struck terror into all the nations. And so this nation has invaded again and is holding uh, is Judah in a siege. And so Hezekiah this time is determined that he's not going to give in, that he's not going to yield, he's not going to compromise at all. And so he's going to stand firm and he's putting all his trust in the Lord. And Bram Shake, who's the spokesman for Sennacherib, comes and he says to the people of, of uh, Judah, listen, don't listen to Hezekiah because let me tell you, there is not a God anywhere that can deliver out of our hands. There is not a nation anywhere that has stood up to us. We have destroyed everywhere. And we will destroy you unless you give in. Don't listen to Hezekiah. And so the, the Assyrians were trying to undermine the confidence of the people. And so it was a hard time for Hezekiah. And he was doing, Sennacherib was doing all in his power, not only to undermine uh, the Hezekiah with regard to his influence on the people, but he was getting at Hezekiah as well. And he's saying to Hezekiah, what are you doing trusting the Lord? The Lord's not going to help you. And Sennacherib is mocking the God of heaven and earth. And you know, it would have been very easy at this particular point for uh, Hezekiah to think. Because this is how Satan worked. You know, Satan would be in at this. And Satan, Satan comes first of all, he comes very often as a cunning serpent. And when that doesn't work, he often comes as a roaring lion. But he would have been coming to, to, to Hezekiah and say, ah, what has God actually done for you? Right? Think about it. What did you do? You destroyed all the altars and all the images to false gods. You established the worship of the living and true God throughout the length and the breadth of the land. You even took the brazen serpent that had, that Moses had constructed in the wilderness. Remember how they looked to the brazen serpent as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Well, the people had actually started to worship that serpent. Hezekiah took it and smashed it to bits in order to stop the people worshipping anyone or anything except the living and true God. So Satan would be saying to Hezekiah, look at all you did for God. What has he done for you now? nothing. He is leaving you all on your own and here you are defenseless against this mighty nation that have annihilated every other nation. That's God for you. And you know, it might be possible that that's the way you are, that's where you are tonight and Satan's having a field day with you as well. And he's whispering in your ear and say, what has God done for you? It's like uh, in Psalm 73, remember the psalmist, he's, he's facing these problems. And he's saying, you know, it's in vain that I have served the Lord. And so he was an amass down, or Satan had got him, and he was looking in envy at the godless. Maybe tonight that's where you are. 
and you're looking at you know people and they don't have any thought of God in their heart or life at all and everything going swimmingly well you're looking at your own life and it's nothing but problems and trials and Satan is saying what have you got out of serving the living and true God so that's where that is where uh, uh, Hezekiah was at this particular moment and Satan wants us to down tools. He wants us to give up. He wants to undermine uh, the living God within our lives. He wants the church to down tools. Because we're all serving God in different ways. And he wants us to stop serving God. If you're a believer tonight, you're serving God wherever God has put you. He's given you something to do. You have an ability and a gift that maybe nobody else has. You can reach people that nobody else can. Satan wants you to down tools. Imagine if all the Christians in the world down tools. There'd be no work for God being done. So God doesn't allow that. And so we find that Hezekiah, Hezekiah here is in a, a really difficult place. And we find that Hezekiah cries to the Lord. That's what he does. And a letter has come. A letter has been sent and been brought uh, by, uh, from the, 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 the army, from Sennacherib to Hezekiah. And this letter is saying, listen, you're finished. And what does Hezekiah do? He goes to the house of God and he spreads the letter before the God of heaven and earth. I love that. And he's saying, Lord, look, this is, this is how it is. There is nothing that I can do. I am helpless against this great might. But, Lord, I, I'm looking to you. And see as Hezekiah prays, and this is what I love about his prayer. Hezekiah prayed, verse 15, before the Lord. O oh Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you are alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. What's Hezekiah doing? Well, as he's praying, he's seeing the, the majesty, the glory, the power, the authority, the control of God. The God who made the heaven and the earth. That's who I'm praying to. And you know, when you and I pray and have this sense of the greatness and the majesty and the glory and the dominion and the authority of God over everything, and if our focus is upon the living and true God, then the troubles and the issues and the enemies become less and less and less in our eyes. And that's what would be happening to Hezekiah at this, at this moment. And yes, these nations, are, they're terrible. Verse, the, this nation is terrible. Verse 17, truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations on their lands. Then he says they've cast their gods into the fire but they weren't real gods at all and this is what i love he then says uh, in verse 16 incline your ear o lord and hear open your eyes o lord and see and hear the words of sennacherib which he has sent to mock the living god lord will you hear his mocking words and will you come in power demonstrating who you are because that leads us into what he is saying in verse 19. So now, O Lord, O God, save us, please, from the hand that, and this is what this is the key, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Isn't that great? Lord, see when you answer this, when you answer my prayer, please, please, Lord, do it in such a way that all the nations will know that you are the living and true God. That you are far greater than this nation. That has struck terror into all the other nations. And you know when you and I pray, we should have a sense of that in our prayers as well. Lord, demonstrate your power. Demonstrate your glory in the answer to my prayer. May your glory be seen so that people will take note, that people will see that you are God of heaven. And you know, the Lord loves when we come to him praying like that. Of course, we then have to leave the answer of how God will answer the prayer. But he will, he will. 
when our prayer is based upon the glory of God and the demonstrated demonstrating the power and glory of God, then God will answer. And God answered wonderfully in the case of Hezekiah. And we see there in verse 20, we see Isaiah, the prophet the Isaiah, the son of Amos, said, was sent to Hezekiah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. And then in verse 32, he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way he came, by the same way shall he return. For I shall defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Isn't that wonderful? Somebody even shoot an arrow. Here's this mighty king. He's been busy mocking the God of heaven and earth. And he's mocking God. What God will say, nobody can save from me. And the God of heaven and earth is saying, you know, Sennacherib, you're not even going to shoot one arrow against my city. You know, we should take encouragement from this and realize that yes, we're surrounded by enemies, just like Hezekiah was. We are surrounded by those who hate God. We're living in an age where so many people hate God. And there is a, an ever-growing movement against the Christian faith to try and obliterate it and to silence it and to ha have it hidden away in a corner. You can't mock the God of heaven and earth. Because there will come a time when he will display his authority and his rule and his might. He's not going to even allow Sennacherib to even shoot one arrow against the city. And you know, the, what, what I love is if we went to Chronicles and that we pick up the same, this same episode, it tells us here that when Hezekiah got this news, he encouraged the people. And this is what he said to the people. There are more with us than with them. With him, that is with Sennacherib, is an arm of flesh. Yeah, he's powerful, but it's just an arm of flesh. With us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And you know, the people took confidence from, from Hezekiah. And you know, it's wonderful when, the, when God's people encourage one another. You make it your business to encourage one another in the faith, particularly in the day that we're living in. We need encouragement. So it's important that we that we encourage one another in the faith. And then we see what happens. God took over. Of course, God was there all the time. God was always in control. But he began to demonstrate his power. And see what happened. God sent an angel. 185,000 soldiers were struck dead. In the morning, Sennacherib, all he saw was his whole army. You can't mock the God of heaven and earth. But God wasn't finished with Sennacherib. You know, Sennacherib should have thought, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, I have never seen power and authority. The God of heaven and earth is not like any other God. I must worship him. That's what, that's what Nebuchadnezzar did, not Sennacherib. He went back home. What do we, where do we find him? We find him in the house of his God and I. But he suffers the most painful death, a death full of shame, indignity, hurt. He's murdered by two of his sons. Can you think of a worse death than that? And two of your sons killing you? That's what it is to mock God. It's a fearful thing. And unless the mockers of God repent, there will come a day when he will come in judgment. God doesn't come straight away, but one day he will come. One day he will come to mark iniquity. God marks iniquity in one of two places, either upon the sinner or else on the sinner's substitute, Jesus Christ. What about you tonight? Is God going to mark iniquity on you, on me, or is he going to mark it upon Jesus in our place? There's only the two options. But I pray that, that it will be Jesus who will be standing in for you and that he takes your sin upon himself. 
and that you will know God's, whatever your situation is tonight, that you will know God's deliverance, that he will, you will know his help, that you will, that you will trust in him in the same way as Hezekiah. Troubles, the troubles that afflict the just, in number many be, but yet at length, out of them all, God doth set them free. That's what happens. Keep on trusting the Lord. Let's pray. Lord our God, we pray to bless us. We give thanks for our time together. Do us good, we pray, and forgive us our sin in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us conclude our service singing from Psalm 27. Again, we're going to sing Psalm, Psalm 27. And we're going to sing from the beginning, from verses 1, verses 1 to 4. Psalm 27. The Lord's my Saviour and my light. Who shall make me dismayed? The Lord's the stronghold of my life. Why should I be afraid? When evildoers threaten me to take my life away, my adversaries and my foes will stumble in that day. Although an army hems me in, my heart will feel no dread. The war against me should arise. I will lift up my head. So on Psalm 27, the Lord's my saviour and my light. My Savior and my light, who will make me this day? The Lord's the song of my life. Why should I be afraid? and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Rest and abide upon each one of you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you very much for tuning in again tonight and may the, God, the Lord bless you and prosper you and keep you all safe uh, throughout this week.